here we are again. It's math with Marty time. Well, uh, boys and girls, Uncle Marty's feeling a little uh, depressed uh, tonight. Uh, the peace plan has not uh, had immediate success in the 24 hours since it aired uh, last night, since we were taping this show only a day after the Math with Marty peace plan first aired. We had hoped uh, tonight to have some of the Palestinian students from the university down to, to give their reaction. And as a matter of fact, I talked to them about it this morning uh, on campus, and there was some interest in it, but they're not quite ready to come on until they've had a chance to review the tapes um, of the show and see if I really said those things that I seem to say. Um, therefore, we're going to go back to math, which is a topic which we're famous for here, and hope that sometime in the future we might be able to uh, get, uh, get some more discussion going on the Middle East question. And uh, in the meantime, let's go over to the big board and see what, see what we got for today. I had a topic that I was working on which concerned how we represent deformations of objects in three dimensions. And the subject of this topic is not so much the question of deformation as a subject of representation, how we represent these things mathematically. Because I want to show that it applies to something, topics more varied in general than uh, just a question of deformation of solid. Although where I learned it most clearly was in uh, working out a particular problem involving solid deformations. So let's just resume a little bit. I had a couple of fundamental deformations which I considered to be significant because for these two special cases, I was able to sh show that no matter what the particular properties of the material, as long as it had normal elastic properties, that deformations of this kind led to, um, let me say, pressures or forces of this nature led to displacements which were proportional to the forces. And these were forces of magnitude 2 from above and below, accompanied by stretching 1 in these faces and 1 in these faces. And I represent send that schematically as 2 minus 1 minus 1. The other kind of significant deformation was where we took uh, a stretching of... Uh, nothing in the up and down directions and we had something stretching in this direction and squishing in this direction and I represented that one schematically as 0, 1, minus 1 and I think what I suggested um, the last time we did this topic was that I could take a combination of forces of type A, forces of type B, and get a system of forces acting on a solid uh, volume, such as, for example, if I take two of these and uh, one of these, I would have 2 times 2 is 4 on this axis, minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1 on this axis and minus 2 minus 1 is minus 3 on this axis. A general system of three axes with different uh, deformations, um, different forces, and that to make this system completely capable of representing a general deformation, I could twist it about 
about the high axis, like so, causing, causing these directions to swing about. And in addition, I could tilt this axis in any direction away from the board this way or that way. And therefore, I have a system composed of a composition of two essential forces, of which then I'm taking it, and I'm submitting it to an additional three degrees of freedom. I'm allowing it to twist about the z-axis, and then I'm allowing the z-axis to tilt out of the board in any angle. There's a total of three degrees of freedom plus two, two basic components for a total of five, I don't know what you call them, five, uh, uh, a system which requires essentially five numbers to specify its total character. And this is quite different from what a lot of people ha are used to who have gone any distance in taking physics associated with mathematics where we learned about vectorial quantities, the kind of quantities you'd use to describe, let's say, the velocity of wind, where uh, you have, at any point in space, a threefold kind of quantity uh, uh, involved, which can be described in the same way as these distortional things, as either can be described as a strength of wind plus a, velo a direction of wind. And to specify the direction, you could specify the angle from the vertical and then an angle of tilt here. So we have two degrees of directional freedom plus a magnitude information. So to specify a vectorial quantity, we can specify a magnitude and direction, which constitutes three pieces of information. One is the magnitude and two pieces of angular information. Now, it is well known that we can also specify a vector by not using the angular form of representation at all, but simply as a superposition of three uh, spatial kinds of uh, uh, distances. In other words, a vectorial quantity with this direction, such an angle, can be represented as a superposition, this vector in this distance, plus this vector in this distance, giving a total displacement like so, plus a vector in the vertical distance, adding up the three arrows, you get a total angle, uh, uh, total vectorial quantity. Either way, it requires three different numbers to uh, describe it, but the, the particular numbers are completely arbitrary. They depend on the kind of representation used. Um, now, my desire here is to show that these kind of distortional quantities, in addition to having a representation which is composed of both magnitude and directional type of information, can also be represented by purely, uh, uh, um, I don't know what to call a magnitude kind of quantities with no uh, direction explicitly given. And I'll try to show what these quantities are in this uh, what is to come. And uh, it's just kind of hard to draw three dimensions. So I'm going to try and make use of a couple of graphic devices here. Um, one of which we'll, we'll take right now, which is the basic uh, tomato here. The tomato has uh, uh, a definite axis of symmetry. There we go. We have a definite axis of symmetry in the tomato through this uh, uh, this part here. So we define the north pole and the south pole of the tomato. And we're going to ask the question, how do you quarter a tomato? And if you think about it, it's fairly evident that there's there's only two reasonable ways to quarter a tomato. Um, you can Cut it through the North Pole. Either way, you've got to start by cutting it through the North Pole. And having done that, you can then either turn it 90 degrees and make another cut through the North Pole, or you could cut it once through the North Pole and then cut it through the equator. And are those not the two ways of quartering a tomato? Let's do it. Well, I guess there's also... Oh, you could cut... 
silly angles. Well, no, but four horizontal cuts, four clean horizontal cuts. Oh yeah, four thirty clean. degrees the equator. Okay, yeah, all that is. Uh, yeah, that's one too. Uh, yeah, thirty okay. degrees from the equator. Anyway. Uh, that's. Uh, I'll do that one too. For, to okay. Um, I'm going to do the one where we cut it through uh, the North Pole, and uh, I can now cut it through the equator. Or I can turn it 90 degrees and cut it through the North Pole again. So let's do that. And uh, there we go. There we go. What have we accomplished? Do you want a piece, Neil? Uh, maybe later. Well, yeah. you go for one. Yeah. Go for one. I'm going to have one while we're at it. All right. Now, in order to cope with this, I would like to, um, instead of having to draw tomatoes on the board and all that three-dimensional stuff, I'm going to unroll them into a, a map kind of format. Imagine this is a map of the world. And we could see we could have the continents in here and we could have South America, North America, We'll have Greenland, we'll have Europe, we'll have the Mediterranean Sea, we'll have Africa. Here we go, and here's the Persian Gulf, and Saudi Arabia, and India, and Malaysia, China, Korea, Japan, Russia, etc. Japan and Australia. There we go. Now, We've laid the map of the world on here to show that we're representing this as a sphere. Now I'll just redraw it below without the map and suggest that our two ways of quartering the tomato correspond to number one, the way I actually did cut it with four cuts. One, two, three. That would be four, four cuts through the North Pole. And that's what it looks like when you... Uh, when you roll it out onto a map. And the other way that I could have cut it was through the equator ones, like so, and then once through the North Pole. I don't have the continents laid out here. Do you want me to lay them out again, Neil? No, I don't know. I don't know okay, what you're going to do next, so I don't know. No, I'm not going to. Maybe I won't lay out yeah. the continent. Well, I guess, like, uh, those are maybe... Is it worth saying that those aren't going to be four rectangles? Like, with the tomato, they're going to be angled at the top and the bottom. Yeah, they're, they're wedges, because, I mean, this is your Mercator projection, or whatever we call it. Yeah, these, are, these would represent wedges. And these wedges, by the way, although they look different on this map, are also wedges of the same... These wedges here are wedges of the same shape as these wedges. With these wedges here on the upper map, the points are here and here. Well, they don't come together on this map, but they would on the tomato. They come together as points. The points on these wedges, where the heck are they? They are here and here. This is actually sort of an arc when you really do it on the actual tomato. Now, there's, there's four points here, and there's, there's points here and here. That's where the pointy parts are. So, I mean, they're quite different, but they're really, if you looked at the wedge, if it wasn't for the fact that the tomato had a north pole through it, the wedges would be the same. The wedges would be the same. Um, now, I think what I want to do now is uh, suggest that It was arbitrary in this case when I made my cut through here. Well, I've made it through, looks like Berlin, I've chosen as my axis. And I want to put a kind of suggestive notation here. Positive, negative. Positive, negative. To represent, and this I'm going to lead back to these deformations. I'm going to su suggest that you're... Um, pushing in on the plus signs and pulling out on the minus signs. So you're supposed to think of this as a way of deforming the earth. Imagine, imagine someone had a big uh, backhoe or tractor and was piling up earth in the places where the plus signs was, scraping it away from the minus signs, piling it into the plus signs so that you had a sinusoidal wave on the earth. 
this is the kind of uh, uh, classical deformation that I, I want to call one of the, the basic types of deformation. The deformation which is special on account of, uh, on account of the displacements resulting from the force are proportional to the forces, unlike other kinds of deformation. And uh, what I got here is, uh, is uh, plus, minus, plus, minus. But I want to say it's arbitrary to the extent that instead of taking this line, let's say, through Berlin, I could have taken it through, uh, well, I could have taken it through, well, Baghdad, for that matter. I could have taken it through Baghdad, and then I would have had a different partition. My partition then would have been one, two, three, same four wedges, but slid over by 90 degrees. And I want to suggest that these two things, which are the same basic shape, but displaced 90 degrees from each other, are two fundamental uh, uh, deformations necessary to represent more complicated deformations in very much the same way that cosine and sine, the same basic function separated, only displaced uh, from itself by uh, 90 degrees, are two very basic waveforms which taken together in various weighted combinations can represent any other sine wave. So uh, I'm taking uh, this uh, wedge-shaped slices and saying that displacing them 90 degrees gives me two, two, uh, two, different, two different systems of cutting the, the tomato. Now when I go to this four wedge thing, where I've cut one through the equator, I'm going to want to do the same thing. And say, here, this is a fundamental representation, but I could have just as well have taken it with my four wedges cut this way. Now, here's a wedge, here's a wedge. These two little pieces are part of one and the same wedge. It's just that it's the seam in the map. This wedge is really continued through here, so that it should have been part of this wedge. And in this case, my plus and minuses would have been plus, plus, minus, minus, or whatever, what have you. So I've got two sectionings of this kind with a slice to the equator, displaced by 90 degrees. I've got two sectionings of the tomato, the kind I discussed previously, where I don't section through the equator, I just cut, cut them vertically, and those two systems are displaced by 45 degrees. So I've got four basic ways of slicing the tomato, and now I add one more, which is the one Neil was going to say four equal quadrants, except I think I'm going to have three. What do I do for this one? I need to draw one more map. Um, I'll draw it down here. And this one goes... Yeah, I more or less cut it in three, and you could call them plus, minus, plus. And uh, it represents sort of squishing the tomato in, top and bottom, and pulling it out at the sides, allowing it to bulge out at the sides while you push it in top and bottom. And uh, these ones don't come out as wedges. They're a little different. But there they are. There's five of them. There's five of these uh, essential deformations. And they constitute a set of, uh, a system of, uh, system of uh, essential deformations sufficient by superposition or combination of different weighted quantities of these essential basic proto-deformations to create any arbitrary uh, deformation system with any angular tilt. Although all of these systems have uh, a high degree of symmetry about the, the z-axis or the north-south pole axis. An interesting system of representation. And I want to 
bring in some analogies in a moment to the d orbitals of the hydrogen atom as described in quantum mechanics textbooks or chemistry textbooks or physics textbooks if you see it done in chemistry textbooks exactly the shapes that i've invoked here are the shapes of the lobes of the d orbital of the hydrogen atom when you see it done in physics textbooks they do it a little differently they use imaginary numbers and use special combinations involving imaginary numbers but in chemistry textbooks i think they use exactly these basic fundamental lobe systems only because they're glossy chemistry textbooks uh, the you draw these cloud representation and they say oh it's much more better because now we can visualize the whole cloud and but what you lose when you try and visualize a cloud is you so don't realize the fact that the shape is really a very basic kind of shape it's a very basic shape related to basic ways which you can cut a tomato so uh, uh, the basic ways of cutting a tomato which which I've illustrated here and if you've taken you know first year chemistry and I know uh, Thousands of people take first-year chemistry every year because it's a prerequisite for getting into medicine, and you know, there's lots of pre-med students. So the I think it's, it's I like to say it's a substantial investment by society in uh, in our cre total cumulative scientific knowledge that people are exposed to a course where they see the shape of these uh, orbitals of the hydrogen atom so I don't think I'm necessarily out of line in invoking them on a TV show of this nature um, we do forget though we do forget the ex university students was we that uh, one of the higher orbitals yeah it's one of the higher ones with more lobes you see the first one is symmetric the first the first set of orbitals the s orbitals are the symmetrical ones then you get your p orbitals which have sort of a lobe going uh, this way this way or this way one of the three possible directions and those are sort of like vectors and then after that you go to the d orbitals and then they show five goofy kind of systems of orbitals and uh, and they correspond to the shapes which i say are useful here in describing deformations of tomato or or a solid or anything like that. I'm going to have another piece of tomato because... Help yourself, Neil. Thank you. I don't know if I want to get into this any deeper. It's kind of a... maybe a more technical subject than I, I really wanted to get into on this show. It's... Um, the subject I'm very interested in, I've always been interested in how, how we represent functions in, uh, in many different contexts. And I think maybe next week we'll look at a simple context of uh, Fourier, how, how useful sine waves are in representing things. And uh, in the meantime, I will give you a problem. Show that uh, the Mercator projection of a map the Mercator projection, the projection which is equivalent to wrapping a cylinder around the Earth and projecting the image of the Earth onto the cylinder from the center of the Earth onto the cylinder, that this projection is a projection which preserves angular relationships, preserves shapes while failing to preserve sizes. We all know that Greenland is bigger than South America on a Mercator projection. But show that a Mercator projection gives the right shapes of the coastline at least over a small enough interval of distance. Think about it. Want to do a song? Let's do a song. We might as well. Key of uh, E. Let's do a different one. Key of E. You know the crowd is kind of small. Turn to her and 
Now he's on the hardwood floor. 